There's a little known part of Hollywood that most people are not aware of, known as the audience test preview. The recently released book, Audienceology, reveals this for the first time. Our podcast series, Don't Kill the Messenger, brings this book to life, taking a peek behind the curtain. And now, join author and entertainment research expert, Kevin Getz. One of the worst experiences of my career occurred in 2015 during a screening of a major tentpole movie. I landed in New Jersey on the day of the screening. I grabbed dinner near the theater, and I was ready to greet the clients before the movie. In addition to the star flying in from London, in addition to the entire studio flying in on a private jet from California, the audience was fully recruited, 400 people, and I made a call, and I said, how are we doing? And my supervisor who was working said, we have 40 people in line. And I said, 40 people? This was an hour before the screening. <sighs> Suffice to say, someone inadvertently in my office canceled the entire audience. What I remember from that experience is not a lot except seeing the head of the studio, Mark Evans, outside smoking and saying to him, I've got to share something with you. And, and I told him and he didn't even sort of flinch. He kind of like looked quizzically. But I have to say that the composure, the graciousness, and the aplomb that he exhibited to the situation, more importantly to me, because I was freaked out, was something I'll never forget. Mark Evans is a very well-respected creative executive. He ran Paramount Pictures at the time since 2015. I think it was 14 or 15. And I've known him for many years prior to that. And he's here today. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Do Kevin. you remember that night? I do. I remember <laughs> that night with such fondness. It is so rare seeing you with any worry. And when you walked up to me, I remember catching your eye 30 or 40 yards away and thinking, Something's off tonight. Something happened. And then you came up and said the thing to me about the audience. And then it ended up great, right? Well, in fairness, okay, so when I screw up, I own it always. I don't try to push it on anyone else. And Karen Hermelin, another dear friend and colleague, was very, also very gracious, as was the star. And all of your colleagues, I have to say, were amazing in what could have been a and disaster. What happened was I rallied my crew, my troops, and they recruited in the mall. Remember, it was 400 seats. We ended up getting almost 300 yeah. people. You had 40 minutes. I had 40 minutes. Yeah. Well, this whole thing we do is complete chaos. And sometimes we forget the value of that chaos in things. And, and we depend on the same stories we've told all the time. We depend on the same way we make movies all the time. And every once in a while, throwing a little chaos into things helps. And the truth is, and, you know, it was a great movie we were testing, and, and I think we all knew we were okay at the end of the day. But there was something about that audience that was different because of the pressure under which they were recruited into the theater. But it was the so interesting that the responses we got were yeah. so consistent to a previous screening we had. Totally. And only showed the improvements that were made. So yeah. it was a whew. I remember sitting around with everybody afterwards, and there was this shock that anything had gone wrong and sort of complete acceptance of it because nobody had ever confronted a situation like that before. And I remember I was up all night reading the cards and you just sat down and you're like, oh, OK, we got it. We're fine. And we've talked about it so much since. It never even came up. Know, Nobody even talked about it it's amazing. as a mistake or an issue. But that is right. That is the amount of time we spend hopefully being the best versions of ourselves, doing all of these things with the best intentions, hopefully most of the time, so that people know when things like this happen, 
Things happen. Yeah, and it's like the actor's nightmare where they come out and, in you know, you're either naked or you forget your lines completely. Totally. That was my version <laughs> of it. I want to say that your composure is very exemplary of why I think you were so successful as an executive. You always have a command about you, Mark, and I just like you so much. Yeah, right. And I don't know, truly, and talent in the town really agrees with that. Like, you're so well-liked by people. Yeah. I want to ask you something. You started, ironically, in sort of documentaries where your first foray into yeah. movies. And I think you were programming director at the Chicago Film Festival yeah. or something, right? So you went to the University, University of Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. And then you go into docs. Yeah. It, the whole process was an amazing thing. And you talk to assistants in the business, and they say things to you, and it happens over everybody's career. Hey, how do I do this? How can I end up getting your job? How can I do that? And the truth is there's no single answer to how anybody gets it. I wish I could write a book about how to be successful in the movie business, and I think people have done good jobs of it. For me, it's always been an anecdotal story. I was a kid who loved movies. My mother loved the movies. I can tell you. Were you from the Midwest? Kansas City, Missouri, heart of the heartland, public school Truman. kid, first generation college, all of that stuff that my poor kids have to suffer the story now of uphill both ways in the snow to school walking for an hour kind of conversations <laughs> with me. But... Yeah, I went to the University of Chicago. I was certain I was going to have to be a lawyer or something like that, get a degree to have a career sort of thing. What did you want to do? I guess I had this dream, funnily enough, that I would do something thoughtful in go to law school. But could that get me into, like, the foreign service? Could I be all over the world in embassies? There was that wanderlust to see the world of a Midwestern boy who wanted to be Well, that speaks there. to why documentaries probably touch you so much. It was a really interesting outlet to see the rest of the world and to do it. So there was this beautiful movie theater at the University of Chicago that they let the students run in many ways. It was the best job I've ever had. And we showed a lot of documentaries and other movies, too. But it's really where I learned about movies. Movies, you How'd know. you get out to California? It was an amazing thing. I very luckily, after leaving school, ended up programming the Chicago Film Festival for five years, traveling around the world. I then had a friend who was moving out to California to go to the Peter Stark producing program NSC. at USC. Yeah. And he said to me, why don't you just come move with me? And I thought to myself, oh, my God, Los Angeles, who would ever work in the traditional studio movie business? I had once written one of those introductory letters at the beginning of the film festival program to crying Hollywood studios for the amount of screens. So you worldwide. turned into a snob and then you now had to sort of eat, eat your hat. It or is eat framed crow. behind my <laughs> desk at home to remind me of the whole process of it. What job? Did you land or did you go to school? I, no, I, you didn't go to Stark. I did not. I came out after traveling around the world for five years at all the best film festivals in the world, and I was broke. And on the same day, I was offered a job to be this wonderful woman's assistant who you'll remember, Julia Chasman, who was a producer, very, very talented producer. And I walked into her office, and I think it's probably the greatest height difference between executive and assistant in the history <laughs> of the business, because Julia is this you know, amazing five-foot woman, and I'm 6'6". Six, six. And she reminds me that I, I walked in as much older than people starting out as an assistant. And I think it was already 27 or 28 years old and said that I'd be in first, I'd leave last, and I really wanted to be in the business. And, and what happened after Julia? After Julia, I went and worked for Nick Wexler, 
Oh, and then Nick promoted great, me. Man. Nick's amazing, and around some of the greatest movies ever, Sex Lies and Videotape, and things <gasps> like that. And oh. then the amazing thing happened, which one of my mentors, Rosalie Swedlin, introduced me to Laura Ziskin, oh. and I went and worked for I think the best producer in the history of the movie business for Laura. I would agree with you. I really would, and yeah. certainly one of the best. Yeah. I will say that first, Rosalie is fantastic, amazing, amazing, and amazing. I'm, Good buddies with Bob Court, yeah. Robert Court, and I've known him for 30-plus years. Tell me about Laura and what she taught you. One of the great memories I have of Laura is when she went from producer yeah. to studio executive. And I said, how is it? And basically her answer is, it's not that different because I'm still selling. Yeah. And I was like, thought that was so interesting. I said, what do you mean you're still selling? She goes, well, I, I don't just get to just green light something. I have to sell to my bosses. And I thought that was just a really interesting fact. Super interesting, right? And, and the great thing about Laura is I had a really rough first couple weeks with her. I'm like, read this, read this. Oh, we're going to sell this. Let's, we can definitely sell this to the studio. And I gave her two scripts to take home maybe the first weekend. And she came back and she said, oh, God, I hate both of these, right? And she's like, I don't know if you're going to make it. And she's like, I don't really have time to be your mentor. She was in the middle of, oh, no. of Spider-Man. Kind of, that had to be a Spider-Man. devastating conversation. Well, and you just think to yourself, and, and she Spider-Man. said- Spider-Man. When she did Spider-Man at Sony with Sam Raimi and Amy and- Wait, I, you were with her after Paramount? Before. The first two Spider-Mans, oh, first, she did those Toby first, and got, Sam. Before Amy- Took the franchise over. Correct. Correct. When Amy oh, was running yes. the studio, she hired Laura to come on and produce those movies, okay. which ended up in one of the most important conversations of my career with Alvin Sargent, who uh, was Laura's longtime partner. Two-time Academy Award winning. One of the greatest <laughs> men on the face of the earth, who was then writing so Spider-Man talented. movies for Laura. And I said to Alvin at one point, and he wouldn't even remember, but it was so impactful of me and sort of defined what became of me as an executive at Paramount. And it really was, in respect to everybody's work, kind of the beginning of the Marvel world mm-hmm. in those mm-hmm. movies and the X Men movies. It was. And by the way, Kevin was there the entire time working on the movie, and you just saw that an empire could be built by him. Kevin Kevin Feige, who runs Marvel, was around for those very early Marvel movies. And I remember one time it was such a simple little thing with Alvin. I'm like, why are you doing this? Why are you writing a a Spider-Man movie? And he said, Mark, the pleasure of making something big good. Ooh. And it it really became a thing that I think about all the time. You know, I thought Ordinary People was the perfect script. It's it's a perfect script. It may be my favorite script ever. Can I say there's one moment in that script that I have to just bring up, and it's scripted. And it's when Mary Tyler Moore's character goes up the stairs, turns the corner of the stairs, and as she goes up, she sees a picture askew. And she fixes yeah. the picture. Yeah. And it tells you everything, everything about her character. Everything about her, trying to put her life back together exactly. that had fallen apart oh, and my. who she was. Listen, it's one of the greatest movies of all time. Funnily enough, aside, my daughter is reading the book in her ninth grade English class oh, this year. Really? So I get to go back and watch it with her. Do you remember Lillian Gish announcing the winner? And the winner oh. is Ordinary Places, People! <laughs> people. Just amazing, right? But <laughs> but this idea that Alvin said to me about trying to make big things good. Yeah, really and we incredible. were really yeah. entering entering the big tentpole era now it, it, with the beginning of Spider-Man and X-Men and Bay starting in on the Transformers movies. And so we're in like 2000, things. right? This is 2002, three. Right, because you went to Paramount in like three or three, four. Three, I think. In right. two, I can't remember now, exactly. I you think come in as a, not a junior executive. You come in as a middle, mid-level, mid-level executive. executive yeah. And you end up running the movie group, which is an extraordinary trajectory. What was that like when you got that job? When I got the job as 
a VP at the studio, it seemed like a dream. It felt like a movie. It felt like I walk onto that lot the first day. My office is Alfred Hitchcock's old office when he made the movies at Paramount. Very first incoming call at the studio was from Bob Evans at 8.30 in the morning. Hey, kid. Hey, Hey, literally, hey, kid, I want you to come sit down with me. A friendship which was really important to me over the time there. And then, look, you spend the years, you go through it, you go up a little third level every time. And then I ended up running creative at the studio. And And all those other divisions, animation and all that. But, but Mark, who called you to tell you you got the job? John Goldman, right, which, of course, had its own – John. Why would John have John called? hired me as a VP. Oh, you mean the big no, job? No, I meant the big job. That yeah. was very great. That that was a conversation at his house in the I he, don't He called you up to his house. He called me up to his house. And we you kind of knew his house. No, I really didn't know. In fact, word on the street was I wasn't going so what to get say to the you? job. He walked me into his beautiful wood paneled office and sat me down and said I'm still going back and forth on this, but if you can convince me now, maybe I'll give you the job. And we sat and talked for an hour about stuff. And by the time you left, you got it? He offered me the, he offered me the job before I left, yeah. And who was the first phone call? God, I assume I called my wife first. It was a really exciting thing. I and can't it, imagine anything more exciting for yeah. somebody coming in from the sort of mid-ranks to make that leap to yeah. the to the big position there. That's incredible. Well, and you know what the place was like, and frankly, the whole business has turned into, which is massive turnover all of the time, right? In my time at Paramount, there were probably five significant transitions what was your of relationship, executives. What was your relationship like with Brad? I have to say it was fantastic, and he was phenomenal to me in difficult times. I mean, he was already sick. Did you know that? I did not. I did not. I but heard he kept it really he kept it, quiet. He kept it really quiet. And look, the, the brilliance of Brad Gray was that he really cared about filmmakers. And his very close relationship, maybe the closest of them, with Scorsese – and Brad would have Marty give him lists of movies to watch. Well, he started in management. Yeah. So and, well, clearly. And, mu- and music booking before oh, that. Oh, I didn't even right? know that. Yeah. I think he booked concerts in New York. So he had a reverence for talent is he my did. point. He yeah. really, really loved talent. Remember what movies Marty suggested? Did he ever share that with you? No, I never saw the list, but you know Marty has a list, right? Like you can go on and find the list. It's a very, very good list. What's your favorite movie? You know, I go back and forth. The Godfather is the first a perfect one. movie. Yeah, and I love the second one as much as I love the first. I don't think there can be better written movies than Casablanca. It's just everything about the movie Archetypal is perfect. And yeah, and, and complex, yeah. you know. And then I'll give you two last ones that we don't have to sit through, but – One of the greatest movies ever made, and I think the first time I saw it in college was because I had read about Scorsese talking about it, is Michael Powell's The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. I've never seen it. So it was made in 42 or 43 in Britain. It was released in 45. It's about the friendship between a British soldier and a German soldier from the Boer War through World War I through World War II, written and directed by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. And then I think my film festival, part of my career, I love a lot of international cinema. And I think Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love is a perfect movie. Wow. Yeah. What a good choice. Mine is Cinema Paradiso. Well, it's impossible not to love. You know, I watched it again. Yeah. And I have to confess, it didn't hit me as powerfully the second time because I had put it on such a pedestal. Yeah. 
And so not that it didn't hold up. It, it of course, did. Yeah. But what touched me at the time was the relationship between the father and the son, yeah. which was, to me, the quintessential sort of leitmotif of that movie. And I just didn't get it the same because my relationship, my dad is different now. Isn't it interesting? I also think, Kevin, it's like... The series of clips at the end of that movie and the first time you see them, right, of all the kisses that were cut out or it is like an extraordinary twist. It's almost a sixth sense. And the impact of that the first time you see it is so extraordinary that it can never be exactly the same the second time. You know who says that? Ed Zwick told me that. In my book, he said that these moments are like having sex, in his case, a woman, (laughs) for the first time. You can never replicate that. It can never Isn't that be inter- exactly I mean, it, the it's, same And way. it's it, there's a beauty and a, and a discovery and a yeah. nervous – you're almost nervous and, right. and excited all at once. And it's yeah. just a special thing, right? Like think about Slumdog Millionaire and the dance sequence at the end of that movie. has nothing to do with the plot. has nothing to do with the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the most important, valuable things in the movie that you can't see for a first time again. Wow. When we come back, we are going to talk about, well, finishing up with Paramount. And then I want to talk about what happened post-Paramount. We'll be back in a moment. Get a glimpse into a secret part of Hollywood that few are aware of and that filmmakers rarely talk about. In the new book, Audienceology by Kevin Getz. Each chapter is filled with never-before-revealed inside stories and interviews from famous studio chiefs, directors, producers, and movie stars, bringing the art and science of audienceology into focus. Audienceology, how moviegoers shape the films we love. From Tiller Press at Simon & Schuster, available now. We're back with Mark Evans. And Mark, we were talking about Paramount right before the break. I want to just say that you've had really some massive successes in Mission Impossible, G.I. Joe, that series. I was super lucky, right? What are some of the other big well, hits I, you had? It, you know, sitting, talking about hits, right? They all depend Under your on watch. the filmmakers. But J.J. rebooted the Star, Star Trek, Trek franchise while I was there. But things I'm massively proud of, like Fincher doing Curious Case of Benjamin Button and Zodiac while I was there, wow. which we partnered with Warner Brothers on mm-hmm. both of those. We had Arrival, which is one of my favorite I movies. I love that movie. And was, what a surprise and what a It was a brilliant movie. Filmmaker. And Denny Villeneuve is just extraordinary. Did you see Blade Runner? The new Blade? The, I, uh, I love. It was a I, work of I love. Art. And I think, I mean, just, I think yeah. Dune, which is a movie that people tried to crack for a generation or generations. He finally He's did. done such an extraordinary job with. But I think sort of the grace to be around and watch all of those filmmakers and some of the producers and, yeah, and yeah, go yeah. through those things. That's where I felt so lucky. One of the movies I want to talk about at Paramount was World War Z. What made you realize it was so not working that how much of the movie did you reshoot? Like, well, I, I heard it was like a quarter of it. M- maybe even more. Maybe a third. At the end of the day, we all collectively made a big mistake with the third act in that movie. And when we all saw it, we knew that. And the producers, Dee Dee and Jeremy, knew it. And Mark Forster, the director, knew it. And again, I think it's under this pressure that certainly at Paramount and I think all around the business, make movies big. You got to make movies big to compete. But you never had audience feedback on that? There was just no need. We had wow. just all made a big mistake. So by the time you did test it, it tested extremely well? It did, but that was after a lot of money in reshoots and about 40 minutes. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. In a funny way, even the difficulty of it, it had some of the smartest people in the business around it, and it turned out to be one of the greatest learning processes, right? I mean, there's a ridiculous notion at the end of the movie of 
Brad Pitt surrounded by a group of old people who are immune to the zombies because they're sick and a crazy massive fight at the end, which delivered no emotional payoff, uh, payoff I think. And then with incredibly smart people, including Damon Lindelof helping us out on it, Chris McQuarrie helping us out on it, the end of the movie is Brad Pitt walking down a hallway. And after having been in the proximity of one zombie, there's a real lesson in that movie wow. that it doesn't have to be massively big to be successful. Didn't you see that on paper, though, before you actually I don't think so, Kevin. Agreed to I shoot really it. don't think we saw it because you're like, oh, it's the third act of a movie. Look what Marvel's doing. Look what Michael Bay did in Transformers. Of course, being big was wrong. It needed oh, to be small. Oh, 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 it needed oh. to be personal. Oh. And that is really what, honestly— very smart, creative people, plus the limitations of going back to shoot something, taught us that you don't always have to be big. And listen, I will give That's you the very great best. Lesson. I'll give you the very best example of it that you and I both know extremely well. God, I hope I don't mess up which movie it is. At the end of Ghost Protocol. Ethan is running in the street and Ilsa gets in that knife fight mm -hmm. with one of the bad guys. The culmination of that movie is Ethan falling into a hole, ending up in the closed box mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and trapping the bad guy. Right. Which was so Tom cool. Cruise was so smart to go, it's going to be completely satisfying if I just jump down a hole at the end of the action sequence. They don't all have to be big. They don't all have to go on for 45 minutes. They have to be right for the character. They have to be right for the that movie. That was a great and scene. And they have to be right for the audience. It's like that glass box or something? Yeah. Yeah. He jumps down a hole right. at the end of the ultimate action sequence in Mission Impossible. Wow. And that's as important to that movie as him climbing the Burj Khalifa. Now, you had some misses. Of course. Everyone does. Baywatch. What would you have done differently now? It's such an interesting question because we committed something to something on the movie which I still feel was exactly the right thing, which was evening out the gaze of the movie, right? The Baywatch as a television show was all about the male gaze and, you know, Pamela Anderson or whoever else going up and down the beach in their swimsuits, their bikinis. And there was a fair amount of that in Baywatch, but we committed to two things. We committed to evening that out by having Dwayne Johnson in the movie and having Zac Efron in the movie. And we committed to an R-rated tone to it. So you changed the DNA I think in a way that didn't help. That probably the audience didn't want the DNA change. But I will tell you, and I am so happy to treat them all as my children and the successes and the failures of it. And there are things in Baywatch that I love and ideas in Baywatch that I think were spot on and really fun. But you might be talking to the wrong person because I love Ishtar. I think Ishtar No, it's is, not about loving it or not yeah. loving it. It just didn't work at the box office. It so did, my question yeah. from an audience perspective yeah. is what went wrong? And, in, and I know you guys came back to us to say help yeah. us to figure it out. First of all, the recruit ratio to start was really challenging, meaning yeah. just people it took X number of, of, of invitations to get a person to come to see yeah. the movie. They weren't interested. They were, exactly. So, yeah. so that was interesting. Um, I'm wondering, did you do any audience testing prior to to find out if there was buy-in to the concept? Or would you have now in retrospect? Oh, for sure now in retrospect I would. And listen, I also think as an era – 
as studios. Because I want to say the movie tested extremely well. <laughs> unbelievably well. I mean, like incredibly well. But I do think looking back now, and I don't even know what it is, 10 or 12 years ago, it must have been. Something like that. We were all in this arms race for tentpole movies that could play for everybody and trying to find those titles or properties that could become franchises. Indeed. And it's interesting because I think in a certain way, we're going to come out of that era a little bit. What now. movie would you not have made in retrospect? Is there one that you're willing to share? <laughs> well, I'm totally willing to share if I think Monster of it, Truck? Know? Monster Trucks was a Monster Trucks, yeah. Monster Trucks was a difficult situation and ended up being a little bit of a feathered fish, I think. The concept of it I totally believed in as a basic idea and it was generated as a bedtime story Adam Goodman told to his son and him talking about those things and there was a core to it that was really really lovely. I think, again, it ended up suffering having to be a tentpole movie that maybe could have worked if it didn't have to be. Mm. But to compete in that world when Marvel had started to grow into great point. what it would be, the Fast and the Furious franchise had matured. We were doing great. So you're relegated mission. to a kid's movie, essentially. And I think that the one thing I would really, really think about in retrospect of the opportunity is, and this is something you say, and I learned from you to be fair, right? And I, you say it often, so correct me if I say it wrong, right? Movies can be for everybody or somebody, but they can't be for nobody. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And, and I think it's a really important thing. And that movie might have been for somebody, but the somebody would have been too small for Paramount's resources to get behind. In other words, it was probably for young boys and maybe their dads, but that's not something that can pay Paramount's overhead. You and know, maybe you're not we in the business. Made it for half the amount. Of exactly. Money, right. But even so, you have to weigh the resources expended from totally. all your folks. Totally. So those are hard decisions. You ended up having so many more successes than any misses. And I can't say that about every studio chief. So that's a really amazing accomplishment, I just want to say. And then you leave Paramount and you start Mark Evans Productions. And I got to just circle back to a huge success in The Mother with Jennifer Lopez yeah. on Netflix. And I believe it was either the first or second most viewed movie last year on Netflix. Is I, that correct? I'm certain it's the top viewed movie of the year on Netflix. I felt very lucky to be invited into it. It was something that came from Kevin Huvain to Elaine Goldsmith Thomas, who's Jennifer's partner, incredible producer. Call and, out to Elaine. Oh, just, I mean, extraordinary woman. And... They had been developing it. They brought Nikki Caro on to the what movie. What a job she did. Oh, she did an extraordinary I'm crazy about job. her. Did you ever see Mulan? Uh, yeah, I loved it. And She did listen, an exceptional the, job. The first movie that got murdered by COVID, right? It was the very, oh, very first that, one. Yeah. They were red carpeting the week before everything got shut down. And extraordinary director. I got invited in. I got to make it with them. I think it's a really special movie. First of all, Jennifer Lopez, I just have to say, is to me, she's underrated, first of all, as a terrific actress. Terrific. But she, the way she holds the screen yeah. and is so badass, yeah. I mean, I loved the movie. If you remember, I, 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 I was. I it's hard because sometimes I have to, it. when I'm yeah. doing my job and have to do the focus group afterwards, I have to sort of yeah. temper it back <laughs> and totally. say, don't put your own opinion but you did a great job, Mark, I have but, to say. Uh, thank you for movie. saying that. Listen, I think it is emblematic of things for us to necessarily be thinking about in going forward in the movie business, right? That is a movie starring an over 50-year-old movie star. It's called The Mother. It's primarily about a relationship between a mother and her estranged daughter. But it is an action it is. movie. It is. But it all does 
have this extraordinary female perspective oh, to yeah. it oh, yeah. that Elaine with and no apologies Jennifer, with no apologies and that Nikki Elaine and Jen re- and yeah. Nikki really yep. cared about and I would venture to guess and I haven't seen the data of it but that's a movie that played so deeply with the female audience what do you mean you on seen Netflix. The data? No, I mean I, oh I, the Netflix I, the, data. The, the, the afterwards. We've talked about it a little well, bit. Well, I right? have a product, a little plug <laughs> called Postvod, and right. so we do do sort of the exit polls, and it was extraordinary. Ex- and, and it I, was a, no, it was really loved. And yeah. I have to say, and I know it's not working, girl, but I think anthemic to those mothers and the idea of being a mother, right? I think the relationship in that movie and the scenes where the mother and daughter are just sitting around talking are every bit as important as the big action scenes Mm -hmm. in the movie. So I feel very, very lucky to have been invited into that and to get to work on it. And I hope we get to do a second one because there are more stories to tell. Another really successful movie was The Old Guard Yeah, with Gina Prince uh, Prince Blythewood directed, starring our mutual friend Charlize Theron. And you're working on the second one now. Yeah. Directed by? Victoria Mahoney. And you are in the process of, right now, yeah. editing and yeah. doing final touches on that. Yeah. And I have no reason to believe it won't be as successful as the first one. Well, thank you for saying it, Kevin. I think it's a special franchise. The well, audiences are so devoted. They are. And invested in that franchise. Yeah. Franchise, it's only one movie, so it's yeah. hard to say yet it's a franchise. But they certainly want it to be a franchise. For There's sure. no question in my mind. Yeah, I think... It all goes back to these extraordinary characters that Greg Rucka created in oh, the graphic is that the, novel. Is that the, I was going to say, it. is that the genesis of yeah, it? Yeah. And I think it's, again, a really special thing. OK, we've made movies about immortals before Highlander. We've made movies about vampires who are immortal and what they face in their dealing with eternity. But I think it's a really special movie that is a little different and a little deeper. I love so much how much the audience cares about the characters. Isn't that something? Right? I know. I agree. It's and, really and, it's really cool to see. Yeah. And the only the only other time I've really seen it, and this goes to the brilliance of Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie, right? Well, I shouldn't say the only other time I've been associated with, is people love all of the characters in Mission. Oh they God. love Simon being back. They love Vandy. And if you remember back. in the last Mission, which I actually think might be the best yeah. of all of them, they were very vocal about and enjoyed seeing Ethan get older and grow. Totally. They love watching that yeah. process. Yeah. And he's still badass. He's still badass. And listen, you and I could both talk for hours of everything we've learned by being tangentially around Tom Cruise for any point in his career. But the old guard, I think, is, again, a great action movie, but has a really interesting core to no, it. No too. question. And you know. I contend that a comedy yeah. that doesn't have heart to it can't be really successful. Yeah. And the same is true of a great action movie, yeah. a great whatever genre it is. If it doesn't have a core of emotional resonance and then deliver on that, it's just a thing. It's just sort of like a journey men or journeywoman's yeah. piece. It's not deeper. And so people don't talk about it and gravitate towards it because they're not emotionally invested. Yeah. And you have to agree with that because most of your movies have that signature. Listen, it is the thing I care the most about. And being around the very first movie after I left the studio that I produced was what I think is one of my favorite movies and maybe the one we go back to as a family and watch the most, which is Instant Family. Oh, with so how could I forget that? Mark, you know, that Mark Sean Wahlberg. Anders directed. And it's just a special 
movie, right? And it is that comedy with heart to it. I don't know. Look, we all Another like, really successful movie, right? Yeah, and we all Won like, even a couple of awards. Yeah, and people care about, and you can be somewhere around no movie business people, and they're like, be on a plane. Oh, what movies did you work on? Those dreaded conversations that you don't want to have. But if you mention a movie like Instant Family, they're like, oh, my God, I love that. You know who loved that movie? My mom loved that movie. Or, And look, we can all we all have to choose how we spend our time. And I want to spend my time on things that I know people will love and recommend to other people. You can remember those conversations that you got into because, oh, whatever, this looks like somebody I could have a conversation with. And then you actually are talking to the audience. I mean, you talk to the audience all the time. You are one of the luckiest men on the planet because you are connected to them in your primary pursuit in the research of it. So... I don't know if you're, you know, three, four nights a week, you're having a conversation with real people who are going to movies. It's something we all have to remember. And if you're not authentic in that process, people will call you out. Yeah. I mean, they just know. They're not going to open up and sort of bare their souls within 30 minutes if you don't show the fact that you are really an advocate for them. I'm here to really represent your voice. Yeah. You know, what's the best piece of advice someone ever gave Mark Evans? Boy, it's such a good question because there have been so many people with good pieces of advice. I'll tell you the most recently, and this one is hard. I had a dear friend and partner on one of my projects say to me, Mark, just when people are talking, just let them finish talking. You don't have to finish their sentence for them. You don't have to jump through something. Just let everybody finish what they're saying. And it's easy to forget. And it's never from the, oh, I'm right. I know exactly what you're going to say. It's usually from the excitement of picking something up and going, oh, my God, that's great. Then we blah, 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 blah. But I I think it and I have a 17 year old and a 14 year old now who often you're like, oh, let me get you through this so we can move on. But it has both professionally and certainly with my kids let me hear them more and and be closer to them. So I'd say that's a really key and present one, Kevin. And then I think, secondly, and I could count maybe on one hand, the people have said to me, make sure you like what you're working on. And both as an executive and as a producer, liking what you're working on is really important. And there are a lot of opportunities to work on things which seem valuable for your career, but you don't really like enough, liking what you're working on is really valuable. Brian Grazer said to me at lunch not too long ago, within the year, he said they were working on this movie, this Christmas movie, and they weren't excited about it. And he finally went to his executive and said, why are we doing this? And the executive didn't have a great answer. Yeah. And they abandoned the project. They said, this is not something we want to spend our time doing. And I thought that was really eye-opening. I want to comment on your first one because I purposely didn't interrupt you. I have got to take that lesson. I tend to get so excited and I often step on my guests. And so I'm going to use that (laughs) advice myself. Mark, thank you so much for being here, for being such a good advocate, a friend. And keep doing what you're doing because you're so good at it. Thank you very much, Kevin. Nice to have been here. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed our interview today. For other stories like this one, please check out my book, Audienceology, at Amazon or through my website at kevingets360.com. And you can also follow me on my social media at kevingets360. Next time on Don't Kill the Messenger, I welcome the president of Sony's TriStar Pictures, Nicole Brown. Until then, I'm Kevin Getz. And to you, our listeners... I appreciate you being part of the movie-making process. Your opinions matter.